This video has been made possible by Paradox Interactive. Solaris is free to play on Steam until the 20th of September, and in addition to that, there is a massive sale going on over there as well. So make sure to go and check that out by using the links in the description as well as the top comment below. With Stellaris 3.1 finally being out, we're seeing the work of the Custodians coming to fruition, and that means that a lot of the previously released expansions will get additional polish, plus there's a bunch of things in the game that are brand new and been reworked. Today we're going to be taking a look at those changes, and that means plantoids, humanoids, necroids, as well as a bunch of additional fluff that you may or may not have known about, so let's dive right in. Let's start off with the red-headed stepchild that is the very first expansion for Solaris. Yes, it is of course plantoids. Plantoids have for a very long time been merely a aesthetic package. It had ships, it had portraits, and it had a bunch of aesthetical stuff, but this has now been changed as of 3.1. If you are one of the owners of Plantoids, you will have the ability to get a couple of new traits. Those traits are Phototrophic, Radiotrophic, and Budding. Now, Radiotrophic and Phototrophic are two of the traits that are very similar to each other, except the Radiotrophic version has a little bit of a spin on it. So, let's take a quick look at what those traits are. First of all, if we go over towards our Species tab and we look at Radiotrophic, or Phototrophic in this particular case, it replaces 50% of base food upkeep with energy upkeep. This is a very, very interesting little spin on things, because it means that food is no longer really a priority for Phototrophic species, as energy kind of supplements all of that. But what does that translate to at the start of the game? Well, if you go into our population, and specifically our workers here, we can see that the upkeep is now half energy, half food, rather than one food as we would have before. This means that in terms of layout on our planetary summary, there is a slightly bigger focus on energy production, but a smaller one when it comes to food production. However, there is an additional civic that has been added to the game for plantoids, which kind of ties into that and synergizes really well. And we will get to that one. So let's quickly pop over towards radiotropes and what they do and how they take a different spin on the whole energy supplements food scenario. Radiotropes, on the other hand, have the ability to also generate uh, the upkeep that they require from food, but and also use the wonderful uh, energy supplement. However, as long as they live on Tomb Worlds, they will no longer have energy any, any energy upkeep. And on top of that, their pop growth speed on Tomb Worlds will be increased, as well as their Tomb World habitability. This generates a very interesting synergy with the post-apocalyptic origin. What we can do here, for instance, if we take a quick look at our population and see what they are doing on this planet, they have a 0.5 food upkeep and no energy upkeep. And that is only when they live on Tomb Worlds. Now, Tomb Worlds, as I've mentioned before, are very fascinating little planets there, and there is not a lot of them within the game. So, for instance, if we quickly pop over towards a standardized planet and take a look at some of the pops there, you will see that their upkeep is significantly higher. Well, let's just take a look at one of our workers, actually. There you go. The food upkeep is there because it is not a tomb world. However, you can synergize this with the apocalyptic bombardment stance. And in order to get this, you can either be a ruthless killer that destroys planets in favor for better habitability and or you could go down the menace route so if we go to our ascension perk and we go into the wonders that is if we can quickly find it become the crisis one of the things that we can get even through this is apocalyptic bombardment relatively early on which allows us to basically nuke planets into submission and then get better worlds for us. Now, of course, this may not synergize too well with one of the civics that is uh, also being uh, added to Plantoids, and we'll dive into that a little bit more shortly. However, what it does do is allow you to create a species that rampages across the galaxy to get the optimal living standard for their population. In this particular case, of course, the radiotropes. But there is one more trait that we need to talk about, and that is, of course, budding. Budding is yet another one of those traits that have been added, and basically what it does is the following. Effectively, what it does is it adds 0.02 monthly organic pup assembly, which is a semi-upgradable system for getting more 
pop growth. Now, assembly speed right at the start of the game is very useful if you don't have robots or anything that uses the assembly uh, line of population growth. So getting this is rather nice. However, it's very important to note that the more pops you have, the more of a benchmark you will have in order to get things up. Uh, as far as I can see, there is no way of adding the budding traits to other species, which I think is rather unfortunate. It would be nice to be able to go down the genetic engineering line and add um, the budding traits to any species that are within your empire and basically go in down in that direction. But as it looks like right now, it doesn't appear to be the case. This basically means that a budding empire does not want to deal with migration and making sure that you have um, other empire species within yours because it will ne negatively affect the budding bonus because for every single pop you have, the higher the cost of getting new pops, at least growing pops, and that also applies to the pop assembly uh, stuff. So yeah, budding wall by itself is very nice and you can uh, do a couple of cool things with this, especially uh, improving monthly organic pop growth assembly and all that stuff. But overall, uh, considering you doesn't look like you can spread it over to other species, it has a bit of a minimal impact. And it is at a two um, trade cost, it can be a bit expensive, but in the early game, it, it has some value, but in the later game, it's gonna cause more problems than that it's worth. Because unless you have like fast breeders or something along those lines, you're not going to get too much value out of it. Hi, this is uh, a spec editing in the future. I, uh, I have just been told that this is actually not the case. You can totally genetically engineer species to use the trait as long as they are plantoid or fungoid in origin. So yeah, you can do it, but you're going to need to go on a little bit of a hunt trying to find other plantoids or fungoids to use them. Anyway, back to the video this and migration treaties are of course good for diplomacy as well so if you are playing as the idyllic farmer species that are uh, completely isolated from the rest of the galaxy budding may be a good choice for you because you won't want to talk to anybody anyway which brings us to the brand new civics and those civics are idyllic bloom and catalytic processing. Now catalytic processing is actually fascinating. It does something that I've been wanting in the game for quite some time and it has been done through mods. However, it is now within the Plantoids expansion and that is the following. It replaces the need for for minerals in order to get alloys and it supplements that with food. So basically what it does is it generates alloys from getting food. And this opens up a whole can of new ways of playing the game because food as a resource is a lot easier to get than people seem to think. Because, well, let's put it this way, if we go to our capital world here and we go to our planet summary, sure, agricultural districts is our main source of food, you would think. However, Considering food is being turned into alloys, and alloys then being turned into ships, in combination with, I don't know, nihilistic acquisition, means that we can get other pops, specifically population pops that are going to be working as a livestock, which then, of course, produce food. This basically translates to that you no longer have the issue of having or getting enough minerals in order to get alloys. This means that livestock oriented slaver species are going to be incredibly powerful because they can crank out alloys by the ton. Now it's important to know that alloys are the only thing that apply to this particular situation. Consumer goods are still being made out of minerals, so you need to keep an eye on that. But the food to alloys transition is amazing because what you can do is you can get food, turn into alloys, turn into ships, getting other pops with those ship through nihilistic acquisition to move back into your planet to create more alloys and so the cycle continues very fun very interesting approach of doing this i'm really looking forward to be playing with this and you should too if you have plantoids one of the best civics that i have seen in quite some time and it completely changes the way you approach to building your empire good fun s tier then we get to Idyllic Bloom. Now, Idyllic Bloom is relatively straightforward. Basically, it allows you to build Gaia Seeders on worlds that are ideal for your starting species. Now, it's very important to give heed to this sentence. It says, ideal 
for your starting species. Now, if we take a look at our species right now, you will see that we are in fact continental preference. This means that if we go to a continental world, we have the ability to build a Gaia Cedar. It has several tiers, it gives us pop growth speed, and eventually it turns the planet into a Gaia world. What is important to know here, for instance, is that I have a tropical world over here, and if I go into the building segment, Gaia Cedars cannot be built on worlds that are not ideal for your class. This basically translates to the, to the fact that you will need to terraform a planet to your preferred class before you can start messing around with Gaia Cedars. Now, overall, this basically replaces a little bit of a functionality here. Basically, what it does is it replaces the ability to get Gaia Worlds through Ascension perks. Basically, the World Shaper ability gives you the ability to create Gaia Worlds. However, this system bypasses that. Now, there are several stages in the Gaia building process, so let's take a quick look at that. So first of all, you will build your Gaia Cedar Phase 1, and it will cost you a reasonable amount of energy and also has a fairly high energy upkeep. Therefore, you kind of want to make sure you get through the Gaia Cedar process as fast as possible, because the faster you do it, the less upkeep it has. And as you can see, in order to upgrade it, we will need gas as well as energy. It's fairly energy intensive, but if you're playing with a species that can generate a lot of energy, then you should be golden. Basically, it allows us to go from tier to tier, increasing habitability over time, and finally, it will allow to um, get the turn the planet into a Gaia world. Right now, I don't have enough gas, but thankfully, due to the miracle of the galactic economy, we can just go into the galactic market and buy the materials that we need. And we just upgrade the building, it finishes, and the planet will turn into a Gaia world. Extremely powerful, extremely good. And on top of that, we will get the idyllic transformation modifier that won't last for too long, only about half a year, but we will get a nice happiness bonus, bonus out of it as well as immigration pull. This basically means that you can turn almost every single planet within your empire as long as you have the prerequisite terraforming technology or if you have enough planets of your own species that you can turn any world into Gaia worlds for a lot cheaper than the Ascension perk. Incredibly powerful, incredibly good. Is it worth long term? Maybe if you're expanding quite a lot and you're gaining a lot of worlds, but the bonuses that you can get out of Gaia World, especially due to the habitability bonus and the resources from jobs and happiness that you can get are totally worth it. And maybe you should go check that one out because it is pretty darn good. And on top of that, a lot of empires like to migrate to your worlds, which means that you can get even more pops to grow even faster. Similar to Plantoids Humanoids, which is also a pre-Lithoids expansion where everything was turned upside down in terms of additional quality for these types of packs, has received additional content. And this translates to two civics and a origin. The civics and the origin can all be played together, and it is rather interesting to say the least. Uh, with the civics themselves, we have pleasure seekers. Now, pleasure seekers are all about decadent lifestyle living standards, on which all pops have increased happiness and consumer goods upkeep. In addition, servants will generate additional amenities. And on top of that, pop growth will be increased through entertainers in addition to healthcare keepers. Now, what does this translate to? Well, decadent lifestyle, as we see on our worlds, are rather interesting. If we go over to our species tab and then we set our rights, we can see that we have the decadent lifestyle um, ability. Now, decadent diet lifestyle increases happiness by 20% for our pops, but also increases consumer goods, which is relatively straightforward. Uh, however, it is very similar to a different type of lifestyle called utopian abundance. Utopian abundance, however, is far more expensive as it increases the consumer goods upkeep significantly higher for uh, specialists and workers. This means that decadent lifestyle is very similar to utopian abundance, except it is cheaper, except it has a bunch of modifiers attached to it. Utopian abundance, however, also generate unity as well as research for unemployed pops, but considering the current way the pop system works, this may not be as effective as it used to be. So yeah, Decadent Lifestyle increases happiness for our pops, but therefore it also increases consumer good 
upkeep, which can be very problematic if you don't want to deal with that sort of thing. Thankfully, uh, there are a couple of things that we can change about this, which is the miracle of Masterful Crafters. Now, Masterful Crafters are the second Civic added to Humanoids, and they work very nicely in combination with those Pleasure Seekers. Basically, artisans are replaced with artificers, then they will create additional consumer goods, as well as trade value, as well as engineering research. Plus, industrial districts create additional building slots unless they are on artificial worlds. Now, what does this translate to? Well, it translates to that artificers, as you can see, they have been replaced with um, the usual are uh, artificers or well, actually they have been replaced with artificers in this particular case they will generate additional resources if we go to our population tab in this particular case and we go to our artificers they will generate a rather large amount of consumer goods normally that amount in this case would have been 10 and on top of that they generate engineering research now engineering research can be incredibly powerful because of the abilities that it unlocks uh kinetic weapons are there uh, a lot of the mega structures are there and anything involving ecumenopoly are in that particular category so it's actually incredibly helpful to have this particular trait consumer goods will never be a problem again which in combination with the aforementioned pleasure seekers will allow for a lot of very interesting bonuses plus of course the prisoner of a job um, modifier will allow for a couple of cool things and of course uh, the hollow theaters where the entertainers hang out will give you additional pop growth, which is really, really nice. But overall, the civics for humanoids, they need to be, they, they, they work in some very interesting synergies. And you can play around with those once you get your hands on this particular update. Once again, this is only part of humanoids. But these two civics, very nice. Nice spin, a lot of RP potential here. But also, they can get out of control rather quickly, especially with that engineering bonus that you can get from the artificers. Finally, for humanoids, there is, of course, the clone army origin. Basically, what it does is it starts you off with two ancient cloning vats that will allow you to biologically construct clone soldiers, of course, and you can only have five of them in your entire empire. Now, you can build them and you can remove them and you can build them somewhere else if you would like to, but there are problems with this and once we get into the game we will go a little bit more into detail on that in addition you can get clone admirals which uh, give you an additional 25 percent fire rate which is definitely not something to scoff at and a 10 percent uh, reduced ship upkeep now these are available to every single empire unless you are a gestalt consciousness so no robots and no hive minds let's dive into clone armies we're going to leave it a little bit high level on this one because there are spoilers potentially here so we'll leave that one for a separate video so welcome to primus the capital world of our clone army yeah, there they are, the clone army. The thing with the clones is, if we go into their traits, you'll see that they have the clone soldier trait, which basically means that they have got a government ethic attraction of 50%, which means that factions will hardly be a problem, because everybody will flock to your preferred faction type. Leader lifespan has been reduced significantly to minus 40 years. That means that your leaders will not get very old, which means that they will have a significant time or a troubled time to get anomalies to get dig sites etc uh, army damage however is increased by 50 percent which is definitely pretty darn good because it means you only need half the um, invasion fleets in order to do anything but you cannot genetically modify them and you cannot reproduce naturally so what does that translate to if we go to our capital world here you will see that we've got these ancient cloning vat buildings now ancient cloning vat buildings have a organic uh, pop assembly modifier of plus seven if we have two of them it is plus 14. if we have three of them at a cost of 504 minerals you it, it's even more course it's 21 so if we go into our population tab and specifically under assembly we will need to pre-select a divine imperium in this particular case as the pop that we want to assemble as you can see we will assemble a pop in eight months time that is extremely quick and if you build another one of these buildings on the planet it's going to go even faster however this comes with a huge caveat and that is the following 
If you read the cloning VAT indicator, what it does is the following. Basically, it produces and sustains 20 clone soldier pops. So this basically means that per planet, you can only have an X amount of pops. In this particular case, for every claim cloning VAT that you have, you can have 20 clone soldiers on your planet. Now you can scale this to 100 in order if you want to get all five of them on one planet, but it will take a building slot. Now what happens if we remove one of these? If we disable this particular building, all we need to do now is, we actually, we're just gonna, uh, is, let's, let's take a look here. Yeah, and it goes down to seven, and we get a little indicator saying, pops are declining because we are currently not producing enough materials in order to upkeep our pops. We currently have 28 pops on this planet and we can only sustain 20 of them. Therefore, we get the modifier of insufficient cloning vats and the population will decline to 140%. That basically means that we will not be longer be growing our population and we will have significant problems keeping our economy up and running. Of course, we can enable this building quite easily by just uh, enable it in general, and the modifier should drop at the end of the month. And there it goes. The modifier has now disappeared. And of course, this means that in terms of gameplay, this me is going to be very interesting because you're going to need to juggle the amount of cloning vats on your planets in a very specific way. If you wanna have a planet with a very high population and a lot of pops, putting all cloning vats on that planet could be an idea. However, you're going to run into problems because, well, you can no longer upkeep all the other planets. So having to shuffle them around is a really good idea. This in combination with some of the traits that we can get through our leaders, if we for instance get an Admiral, we will get the clone Admiral trait, which gives us a whole bunch of bonuses in combination with say Gale Speed or even Hard Hitting, then we can get some pretty crazy Admirals and some pretty powerful uh, navies very early game. But that is not everything. As the game progresses, a storyline will start to unfold, starting with the great debate. Where did the clones come from? Because in the end, they are only clones. What is their origin? Where did they come from? And how can they change their lives? Not as a story of the clone soldier origin. We won't go into much detail about this because once again, it goes into spoiler de de uh, territory and I don't want to do that in this particular video. So make sure that you check out the uh, or clone origin video very soon, but still a fascinating little origin where you have to juggle pops that are extremely fast growing, but you can only have so many of them. You could bring in migratory species and other species to grow on your planets, but you're going to run into problems if you have more of those than your own pops, because then your factions will start to become an issue. And then you have to juggle that little problem. Anyway, these were the origins for humanoids, or at least the update for humanoids with the civics as well, of course. So what does Necroids have in store for us this time around there, custodians? Necrophages have been reworked ever so slightly as well as, uh, well, they are no longer one of the strongest origins within the game. And that has to do with the fact that the type of primitive worlds that will spawn nearby them will no longer be as large as they were in the past. Right now, for instance, we only have eight pops over here and we only have about four pops over in this system. In the past, this could have been over 20, but this is no longer the case. In addition, to that there has been some changes as well to some of the buildings for instance the uh, chamber of elevation no longer gives you a stability bonus on the planet so you no longer will have to deal with that well you'll have to deal with that because you no longer have it let's put it that way but that's not the only thing that comes with the necroids edition of the custodians no we have the wonderful world of the reanimators the reanimators um, are a little bit different than what they were before. They're even named different. They used to be called reanimated armies, but now they have been changed slightly. Dread encampments are obviously still there as they are replacing the military academy. But in addition to that, we also have special undead armies. And it has a couple of modifiers attached to them. Basically, if you defeat an organic army, 
Sometimes they are resurrected as undead armies. Okay, so going for a planetary invasion against a species that has a lot of armies on the ground, then bringing them back from the dead and sending them out into the trenches is totally possible. But the big one over here is defeating organic leviathans can sometimes mean they will be resurrected. Now, what does that translate to? Now, as you kill one of the um, organic leviathans, in this particular case, the Void Worm, you will also have the option, aside from Commendable, to send in the Necromancers. Basically, you get all the usual bonuses, such as the Dragon Slayer Monument, the uh, bunch of influence, as well as the Dragon Slayer trait on one of your Admirals. You will get the ability to reignite the extinguished Aether Drake. Now, this is immediately a, a event that comes up, and uh, basically, you will need to send over a science ship as fast as you can to reignite the Aether Drake. Now, where is it? Well, it's usually hanging around the star, and what you do there? Well, you send in a science ship and let things go. Now, reigniting a Aether Drake can be a lengthy process, so it's going to take a while for you to get the dragon or whatever type of animal you're trying to resurrect. But is it going to be worth it? Well, we're about to see, won't we? As the dragon rises again, it will hunger and immediately spawn. And there we go. We have ourselves a brand new Aether Drake. And uh, we can control it, of course. It is... Uh, Pretty darn powerful and uh, pretty darn good because who doesn't want to supplement their fleets with a Aether Drake or even, I don't know, some Void Worms maybe? What is possible we don't know? Well, bubbles can be resurrected, for instance, in case it sadly perishes in some weird way, shape, or form. Now, the Aether Drake itself is pretty, uh, pretty standard to what you would normally expect. You cannot uh, investigate it because, obviously, it's so strange that we don't know what on Earth is going on. But it doesn't matter because we were able to resurrect it. All we know is that we now have a single entity that has 40,000 fleet power available to you. Now, this obviously is not the case for every single species that you can resurrect, but it is an option. So make sure you go and try that out and get those leviathans on your side. Now, this is not the end of all the things that have been added to previous expansions. Whilst humanoids, plantoids, and necroids have received the brunt of the rework, there have been additional things and tweaks done to other expansions as well. Synthetic Dawn, for instance, rogue servitors can now take the Arcology project so they can get Ecumenopole, which is incredibly powerful for their, um, you know, their pampered pops because they can now live in sanctuary Arcologies where they can just hang out. Apocalypse gets a new unyielding tree we will get into that shortly megacorp uh they no longer have the temple of prosperity building anymore if you are a subversive cult and they they have now been replaced with something called a subversive shrine ancient relics gets additional archaeology sites three of them we will dive into those in a separate uh, video lithoids gets additional in interactions with events and nemesis once again also get selectable traditions. So let's take a look at this new selectable tradition system, shall we? If we go into the traditions page, you will see that there is a brand new window and no longer do we have the big blocks here where it shows what kind of traditions we will have uh, pre-masticated for us. No, instead we can select any tradition we'd like and fill those in wherever we want. Now this has, this is based on the type of empire that you're playing Robots and hive minds will have different trees, but in general, you can pick whatever you want. Any of these particular um, choices can be supplemented with different choices. And I would not be surprised that over the continuing life cycle of Solaris, we will see more and more trees being added. But some of the main ones that have been added here are none other than Mercantile, which is a combination of the old diplomacy tree as that is more focused on um, basically getting more money, more trade value, etc. It can be very good if you're playing an energy base empire subterfuge has been added for those players that are that like to play with nemesis and like to play with operations that is one thing for you to play with and of course unyielding is part of the apocalypse update where you can play around with defensive structures all of the uh, other tradition trees have been shuffled around and you can play around with those and try to figure out what will be a good synergy but no longer will you have to go for discovery adaptive uh, expansion 
expansion, harmony, prosperity, etc. No, you can mix and match whatever you like at any point in time. Do you want to have an empire that is incredibly supreme and, well, supremacy and attacking other empires while at the same time being a bastion that is almost impenetrable whilst at the same time uh, doing operations on other empires? Yeah, you can totally do that. Do you want to be a mercantile empire that also is focused on prosperity? You can totally do that. Pick and choose the traditions that you like to have. Play around with them. What do you think is powerful? What fits your current situation? Very good to change here in the 3.1 update. And I'm very much looking forward to see how this is going to work out and what more content we're going to get in the future. Is the UI element great? No, it's very overlapping with things and it's a little bit in the way. But as far as I've been told, this was pretty much the best way of implementing on how this uh, would work. But still, Traditions, a big change here, and is going to change your playstyle quite significantly. Of course, finishing one of these trees is still going to give you access to the Ascension perks. And how that is going to work out in the future, who knows? Anyway, there's one more thing we need to talk about, and that is Ringworlds. For the longest time, the Ringworld origin was considered to be one of the more powerful ones in the game, as it had a bit of an easy start. You would have your five districts, you would fill those in, you would get your minerals off of the interloper and all that good stuff and then spread out into the wild yonder. No longer. The origin has been changed in such a way that may surprise you because if we go to our capital here, you may notice that all of our districts are A, uh, either blocked or used, but there is no longer five of them. There is 25 of them, actually. And this is because the Shattered Ring now starts out as a size 25 world that looks like a, sh uh, like a ring. Now, what does this mean? It means that you will have all the abilities that a normal planet has. And basically, this translates to that you will have your city districts, your industrial districts, your trade districts, which was not a thing that normal empires get, so it's still quite powerful, your agricultural districts, and finally, a mining district on a, on a ring world. Now, the idea behind this is, is that you will have pops called scrap miners. Basically, scrap miners produce both minerals and alloys. Basically, they generate five minerals and three alloys, and that still means that the ring world is still quite powerful powerful you may want to balance it out to see whether or not you want to keep it like this or if you want to go ahead and fix the ring world because you can still do that yes you can still turn the ring world into a proper ring world structure with all the special segments that come with that the scrap miners are an interesting idea and having uh basically miners going out into the superstructure of a ring world that is obviously designed to hold so many more pops than are actually over this makes perfect sense you know you scrape a little bit off uh, minerals and alloys off here and there to use on whatever you need them to which i think is a really cool idea but it does completely change the way the ring world origin plays so make sure you go and try that out it is a nice little change i do think that ring world's uh, play is going to be a lot more interesting than it used to be because you no longer have that flexibility but instead you have different flexibility in terms of uh, the scrap miners very cool stuff looking forward to see if we're going to see similar changes with some of the other origins in the game in the future then that wraps up the generalized overview and that wraps up this overview of all the major changes that have been added to the 3.1 Lem Stanislav Lem patch. A very, very exciting time for Stellars where the custodian team is gonna is coming in to add new stuff to older content as well as fixing and rebalancing materials that are no longer synergizing very well with the current development cycle of Solaris. Hell, Plantoids is almost five years old. It is more than five years old, actually, at this point in time. And the team going back to do new things with it is a very exciting thing. And I cannot wait to see what they're going to be doing with some of the other expansions. Which brings me to the final point. As this video has been made possible by Paradox Interactive, now would be a good time to pick up those expansions that you've been missing from your collection. I 
can imagine that some of you don't have humanoids or plantoids because they didn't add any additional value to the game before aside from aesthetics. Now that they've added all of these new traits, origins, as well as civics, it may be a good time to take a look to maybe pick up these or maybe some of the other expansions that have been missing from your collection. There's a link in the description down below as well as the first comment that will take you over to Steam where there is currently a massive sale going on with most of the expansions being on set sale. In addition, if you want to play the game for free for the next week or you want to get some of your friends into the game and play some multiplayer or basically say, look, I didn't have time or my, my friends didn't have the money or the resources to get into the game, now would be a good time to try to get them on board and have some fun. As I mentioned, Solaris will only be on sale for a week until the 20th of September of 2021. Maybe in the future it will happen again. Who knows? But in the meantime, make sure you go and check that out. I want to also thank my patrons for making this video possible. It is a bit of a longer one, and that's why people like you um, make this possible. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the time or the resources to do what I do. Thank you so much for watching. Go and try out these new mechanics that are coming in with LAMP. If you have the opportunity, pick some of these new expansions whilst they're cheap. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take good care of yourself and praise the custodians.